goes. So, um, uh, Dr. Bob Stanton, um, who's been a longtime Astley member, retired in 2022 after a 49 year career as a professor of mathematics and computer science. He has enjoyed astronomy since elementary school. He's also a gardener and is an award winning daylily hybridizer. And so if you go up to planting fields and wander around one of the gardens, you'll, you'll see things stuck in the ground with his name on it of, of uh, I guess you say varieties that um, he has hybridized. So I'm looking forward to learning about fractions tonight. Um, Bob Stanton. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ken, for the wonderful welcome. Let me share my screen. And uh, you should be able to see. Wow, it worked. It worked. Yes, that's, yeah, that's cool. Uh-huh. Okay, so let me uh, try to get onto my software here and get all the Zoom stuff out of my way and, uh, and get to the beginning of the talk. Uh, so uh, the quote from the NASA website, the moon takes uh, 29.5 days to return to the same point on the celestial sphere, 29 and a half, that sounds kind of reasonable, but that's just an approximation of the true value. Now, continued fractions are the gold standard for computing this type of approximation. Uh, this talk will emphasize the construction of a calendar because it is the ideal illustration of this mathematical concept applied to astronomy. We don't have to use any advanced physics or any advanced mathematics to just deal with calendars. Uh, then I will briefly suggest how this concept can be used in the construction of a planetarium and in the predict prediction of conjunctions. And at the end, uh, this is a bonus here. I will consider the scientific me method from the perspective of, math of a mathematician. Uh, so first, now let's look at the calendar. Time on Earth has two basic measurements, uh, units of measurement, the day and the year. Everything else is an arbitrary derivative of these two. The two basic units are mainly dependent on two movements of the Earth, the revolution of the Earth around the sun, and the rotation of the Earth about its axis. Now, disregarding daylight savings time, uh, we want each calendar day to consume the same amount of time. The length of an astronomical day is based on, but approximately four minutes more than the period of the Earth's rotation. And I'm not, I don't want to say anything more, more than that. It's important, but it's really outside the scope of this, the court, uh, this talk. Uh, the word year will have two different meanings. One complete revolution of the Earth around the sun is an astronomical year. Okay, so that's just strictly dealing with astronomy. The length of time consumed by an astro astronomical year can vary, but just with, as with days, we'll use an average. The time consumed by all the years on a calendar is a calendar year. And the default for year is calendar year. If I just say year, that's what I mean. Uh, unfortunately, the astronomical year does not consist of a, a whole number multiple of uh, days. 365 too small, 366 too big. So our next hope is for the multiple to be a, a, uh, the, to be a rational number. Uh, uh, rational number means one whole number divided by another whole number. Of course, you can't divide by zero, okay? Uh, ideally, one with a small denominator. But the probability of something like this happening is zero. All right, here's our first mathematical interlude. Probability, as is taught in school, assumes that the set of all possible outcomes called the sample space is finite. <laughs> so if an event has probability zero, it's impossible. However, this doesn't apply if the sample space is infinite, say all the values on an interval of real numbers. Suppose you have to randomly pick a single value on a number line. There are infinitely many candidates to choose from, so the pro probability that a specific number is selected can't be a positive number. Uh, so when a sample space is infinite, we say that the probability of an event is zero, if its probability is less than epsilon, for our, our, us mathematicians love our Greek letters, don't we? 
uh, for every real number of epsilon. The number that was actually sele selected has probability of zero selection of selection, but still it was selected. And another point is that a irrational numbers are more abundant than rational numbers. You know, the rational numbers, the ones we know, the irrational numbers are lurking in the background, but there are a lot more of them than there are rational numbers. If a point on an interval numbers is selected is at, at random, the probability that it is irrational is one, and the probability that it's rational is zero. Okay, I want to look at a different calendar. So suppose we want every year to have the same number of days, and I said, say 364. Well, the reason I picked 364 is the prime factorization of 364 is two squared, two times two times seven times 13. Okay, that's nice, factors it to a lot of small numbers. In particular, 364 is divisible by seven. Uh, we could have a week with seven days, and that means there are exactly 52 weeks in a year. No stuff left over. Uh, and now using the idea that uh, 364 is 28, that's two, two times two times seven, that's 28 times 13, we can have 13 months, uh, each with four weeks to 28 days. So in this new calendar we have, every, calendar, every month's calendar in every year looks like what you see on the screen there. Okay, I mean, there's no, uh, what's, what, what day of the week is the first of the month, you know? I mean, everything starts on a Sunday, everything, you know, uh, day 28 is on a Saturday. Every month looks like that. All right. Uh, well, this is so simple, it's kind of boring. Uh, that would be its name, uh, ah, the boring calendar. That's what we call this. Oh, by the <laughs> way, uh, 28 here. 28 days in a month, well, 28 just happens to be a perfect number. Uh, and what that means, for those of you who don't know, which might be the whole rest of the audience, is if you take all the divisors of a number other than itself and add them together, you get the number. So one plus two plus four plus seven plus 14, that's 28. Perfect numbers are very rare. So perfect calendar, actually. Uh, consistently is, is the strength of the boring calendar. But there's a major shortcoming. In a 10-year period, there'll be either 12 or 13 less days in the new calendar than in the established one, month one. So go ahead 150 years and say we use the same month names. It'll be winter, oh, same month names. We need the, an extra name. Let's see, September, October, November, December, Ender. Okay, th 13th month is Ender. Uh, we're not gonna need to use that anyway. But anyway, winter in uh, July and summer in January. We don't want to have that. Uh, so this will destroy the uh, seasonal cons consistency. So we could use leap weeks. We can't use leap days because that will ruin the symmetry of the calendar uh, or leap months to eliminate those deficiencies. Now, how do we compute these things? We use continued fractions. Excellent tool for the creation of these, this type of rule. So finally, let's see what continued fractions are. Fourth grade mathematics. I think this is fourth grade. Uh, so we can divide one positive integer by another and get a quotient and a remainder. So if we do 48 divided by 37, we get uh, 48 over 37 is one plus 11 over 37, all right? Now we're gonna rewrite this as, as follows. Now I don't have the rewritten thing down here, but uh, just give me time. I'm going to turn the 37 into a fraction. I'm going to move the numerator into the denominator of the fraction. And I now have this as uh, 1 plus 1 divided by the fraction 37 over 11. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, um, I got uh, something blocking my uh, uh, the thing I need here. 
Oh, where is it? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna increase the size of the uh, text because these fractions are gonna get kind of small and we're going to need, need to, uh, 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 to see them well. Okay, uh, now you look at this and you say, oh, look at that. He just took something easy and he made it something hard. I can hear, hear my students saying, why do you do that, Dr. Stanton? Okay, but uh, let's see. First of all, you know, sometimes just being creative gets you good things, whereas not being having any creativity is, you know, that never gets you anywhere. But look at the thirty-seven over eleven. It is a fraction whose numerator is greater than the denominator. Uh, same thing with forty-eight over thirty-seven. Now. There's a technique in mathematics called recursion, which is used over and over again in all different branches of mathematics. And it can kind of be something to do, uh, summarize like this. You do a, uh, you take a mathematical object and you do some operation on it and you get a different option. And then take that different object or a part of it, do the same operation on that object and you get something new and then you do it over and over and over again. And lots of times, you know, you do it a number of times and you really get something that's wonderful. So that's what we're gonna do here. The 37 over 11, that's a fraction. We divide a 37 by 11, we get a quotient of three, remainder of four. And uh, so we can change the 37 over 11 into three plus four over 11. And guess what? Uh, if we did it once, we could do it another time. So uh, the, 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 the denominator, the last fraction is three plus one over 11 over four. Do it with 11 over four, do it with four over three. And at this point, you know, in all the previous examples, we got a fraction right here where we had this denominator. We don't have a fraction there. Uh, so this is uh, a point where we could go no further. Uh, and this is what's called the continued fraction expansion of 48 over 37. So for those of you who knew what a fraction was, but not a continued fraction, you've now seen it in action. Okay, continued fractions, great for approximating real numbers. Let's take a look at our example. Again, you know, this is a, uh, a rational number. Remember a rational number, integer, uh, whole number divided by whole number. Uh, uh, so we really don't need to approximate it, but let's just see how the approximation would work. Uh, now we take each successive step and we call these things convergence. Now let me go back and, uh, and look here and show you what the convergence are. Uh, so the first conversion is just one. And the way you do that is uh, you have a plus sign plus a fraction and all the stuff after the, uh, uh, including the plus sign, you just throw that stuff away. And by the way, when I'm highlighting here, I'm say, saying, not saying look at it, but I'm saying throw that away. Okay, now the next one is one plus one over three. You know, you go after the three, the plus sign, throw it all away. And you see, I have it here. Uh, and then the next one would be one plus, uh, one over two, and then throw this stuff away, and then finally throw this stuff away. And those give you the convergence. And I have them listed down here, and we actually compute their numerical value because, I mean, it's just arithmetic. You can, I mean, it looks, it, it looks ugly when you get to the end, but it's just arithmetic. You can get them, these are the values. Uh, and you see we're getting numbers which are closer to 1.297 something. Uh, one thing that we, have in this example uh, is that the denominators are rather small. And this fre frequently happens with uh, the convergence of a continued fractions. Now, we're going to be applying this to astronomy. So we're not gonna be using rational numbers. We're gonna be using 
uh, essentially decimal approximations of some astronomical value. Uh, and that is, you know, uh, replace a decimal by a fraction. Uh, before getting into astronomy, let's just take a, a typical example of a number that's, uh, uh, you know, well known in mathematics, and that's the number pi. And let's do the continued fraction with pi. Uh, so uh, we have a quotient of three, remainder of 0 0.14 for, uh, one for something. Uh, do the continued fraction thing, you get one over this guy. And now we have to do this thing. And you say, oh my God, that's ugly, but we got a computer algebra system here. So no problem with that. Okay. And let me actually put that in the display. So uh, what do we have here? We have seven is the integer part. Uh, 0 0.062 something is a fractional part, and you go ahead and you come up with this continued fraction. Uh, before going on, look at the conversion. So that means throw away the stuff that's highlighted, and you get one, three plus one seventh, that's 22 sevenths. Well, that's a really good approximation to pi. Okay, a common approximation to pi. Uh, I mean, you know, when you, well, when I got to the seventh grade, my seventh grade teacher said, Pi is 22 over seven, okay? And uh, let's see how good of an approximation this is. And uh, uh, we see that uh, the difference between pi and 22 sevenths is 1.2 something times 10 to the minus third, uh, third power. Uh, this illustrates how dumb I was in the seventh grade because uh, the teacher first told us that pi was 22 sevenths. And she then said pi is 3.14. And I was really too stupid to notice that 22 sevenths to 3.14 are not the same number. So pi can't actually be both of them. Uh, in any case, let's go to compute numerically. And uh, basically comparable uh, uh, accuracy between 22 sevenths and 3.14. But look at this. The denominator of our approximation is seven. Okay. The denominator of 3.14, well, of course, this is an even number, so you can reduce it uh, uh, to lowest terms. Uh, the denominator comes out to be 50. You have same size approximation which with a much smaller denominator, really good stuff. Okay, uh, pi will actually have an infinite continued fraction because it's not a rational number. Uh, we'll do two more steps, get the conversion and we see that the conversion is 355 over 113. Uh, now several mathematics books promote this as an excellent approximation of pi. And let's see how good this is. Oh, that's, that's really good. Remember I said that this is the gold standard for approximations. Look at this, uh, just uh, one, two, three steps, and you have an approximation good to uh, 10 to the minus seventh power, okay? Compare that to the decimal uh, expansion with the denominator 10 to the sixth, pretty comparable, but Instead of a denominator of a million, you have a denominator of 113. Produce, we're producing very accurate rational appro uh, uh, approximations with a small denominator. And the theory uh, supports this uh, conjecture. Uh, getting a little technical in terms of math here, you know, in math, you have to do precise definitions. So we have a rational number in lowest terms, A over B is the best approximation of the real number t if the absolute value of t minus a over b is less than or equal to the absolute value of p over q for any rational number, uh, p over q, uh, you know, not equal to a over b with uh, zero less than or equal to q less than or equal to b. Okay, so it's uh, best approximation says 
with denominators of b or smaller, this is the best you can do. Sometimes there's two numbers, uh, uh, one on each side. You know, for example, if you take nine tenths, uh, you can have a four fifths on one side, which is one tenth away, and uh, one on the other side, which is one tenth away. And it, both of those are best approximations, which is why uh, the indefinite articles used here are not the definite article. Okay, uh, an amazing fact about continued fractions shows that our work with pi is not an accident. And we have a theorem. What do mathematicians do? We create theorems and prove them. Uh, so the theorem says every best approximation to a real number t is a conversion of a continued fraction of t. Okay, so that's it. If you want a best approximation, you have to do a, con a continued fraction. Uh, anyway, you can, uh, uh, proof would be too much, you know, even for, for a math presentation at this point, it's re really very complicated, but look it up in a number theory book if you're interested. Uh, on the other hand, I'm thinking that probably it's okay if you're not interested and you don't bother looking it up. Uh, anyway, well, uh, what we now want to take our brand new tool and apply it to the calendar. Uh, so start by looking up the mean number of years uh, in an astronomical year. The number we'll use is 3.65 point and all those decimal things you see at the end. Now, one of the things about continued fractions, if you have a very large integer part to start with, you start getting ugly numerators, you know, which are really too big. And if you just uh, drop the integer part and just use the uh, decimal part of the fraction, you really do get the same uh, continued fraction, but it just looks easier. And so that's what we're going to do in this particular example. Uh, so let's take uh, the continued fraction for 0 0.24, etc. And when we do the arithmetic, we get uh, this is equal to, uh, it's reciprocal, it's 4.1 something, and the continued fraction becomes zero plus one over four point something. First convergent, actually, I didn't do the, the next step, but it's just eliminating the decimal part, uh, is uh, one fourth is 0 0.25. Let's stop here and try to base a calendar rule. Now, base, the, the basic rule is, when do we insert the leap years uh, on this convergent? So we have to add one leap day every one, and I get the one from the numerator of the fraction out of four out of the denominator years. And <laughs> if we use just one convergent, uh, this is the error, uh, 0 0.007 point something. Uh, Essentially, not off, off by less than eight days in a thousand years. Uh, not bad. In fact, this is the Julian calendar that was uh, introduced by Julius Caesar in 45 BC, and that was in widespread use in the past. And some parts of the world will still use this calendar today. Uh, well, how much error is going to be accumulated for those using the Julian calendar today? If we round off, it's approximately 2,070 years. Uh, you know, you don't have to be really fussy here. You know, anything within a 150-year span will do. Uh, the two calendars should be 16 days apart, approximately. Uh, the Julian calendar is still very much available on the uh, internet, and you can look up the actual difference. And the actual difference is. 13 days. Uh, difference is not mathematical, it's attributed to human error. There were years uh, when the rules for adding leap years were not always followed. Okay, well, let's continue our continued fraction and try to get <coughs> more accurate for the Julian calendar. So uh, again, I'm not gonna go through the details, it's, you know, just trust that I went through it and got, got these answers. And our next convergent is one over four plus one seventh. Okay, and that means throw this stuff out. And that's seven over 29. 
uh, if we use this estimate, then search seven leap years every 29 years. Uh, check it for accuracy. Oh, that's really good. More than 10 times as accurate as a Julian count. If we go one more step, uh, and uh, again, I'll skip, uh, you know, I'll skip over the uh, 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 details. Uh, we have this, the continued fraction here. And again, uh, ignore all of the stuff that I've highlighted. That's eight over 33 and slight improvement there. Okay, now both of these rules are ec excellent and, and go well beyond the Julian calendar, uh, but uh, how we implement them. To, to, to do the last one, we have to do eight leap years every 33 years. Uh, so this is actually, actually seems to be harder than the Julian calendar. Uh, there's an elegant but off, uh, easily overlooked mathematical concept uh, that can come overcome this difficulty. But, you know, as I said, it's e easily overlooked. To, so to get to our uh, current calendar, we have to find another way. And uh, continued fractions will help us do that. Uh, I'm not going to get to that right away, but because I want to give you an indication of how this works by looking at the boring calendar. Uh, so, uh, the symmetry of the boring calendar is ruined if we just insert one leap day. day. So let's look at uh, inserting leap weeks. So now what we're going to do is to convert the number of days in an astronomical uh, year into the number of seven day weeks in an ast astronomical year. Divided by seven, we get 52.177 something. Uh, and again, We'll just do the continued fraction for the decimal part. Uh, I'll just show you the, uh, the work. It comes out to be eight over 45, eight leap weeks every 45 years. So you see the error there, a bit more than three weeks every one, uh, 10,000 years. And if I go to the sixth convergent, I'm not gonna write down the details of that, we get an error of you know something times 10 to the minus six. Very good. Okay, let's uh, use another calendar, look at another calendar which uses a similar year uh, idea. Uh, a new year in the Hebrew calendar will start with a new moon and a month will last from one moon to the next. Uh, this requires the insertion of leap months periodically, just like the boring calendar requires the assertion of weeks. Okay, average number of new moons in a year is the number I have down here, 12.3 something. Do is continue fraction expansion. Again, uh, the, I'm just showing it without doing any of the work. And we have these convergence. Uh, look at this guy. That's the sixth conversion. We've gone out six times and we have a denominator only uh, of 19. That's a really good one to use. And in fact, that is the one that's used in the Hebrew calendar. Uh, so let's see what we have here. Uh, take 235 uh, over 19, we get 12 and 7 19ths. So in a 19 year period, there will be seven years that require leap months. Now, that concept that I mentioned before that was easy to overlook, well, we don't overlook it when we do the Hebrew calendar. Uh, so uh, another mathematical uh, interlude here. As we mentioned earlier in the talk, when we divide a positive integer A by another positive integer N, we get a quotient Q and a remainder R, uh, the remainder bigger than or equal to zero, less than N. We, can, we encapsulate the remainder by the expression R is equivalent to A modulo N. And we write it in this really nice compact form. Uh, we, and we now have the tools to determine uh, a formula for whether a year in the Hebrew calendar has a leap month. And here is the rule that's used. Uh, the year Y has a leap month uh, exactly if uh, 7Y plus 1 
modulum 19 is less than or equal to six. So the number, uh, any, all, all the numbers mod n are, go from zero to 18, uh, mod 19 go from zero to 18. And if it's less than six as seven, seven values, that's, that's what you, you do. Uh, now, this is kind of nice. We can check this out. Uh, can anyone tell me uh, what year uh, uh, this is in the Jewish calendar? Uh, no, okay. Well, I'm just gonna pick out something at random here. Whoops, cats put the plus one in there. And we get four. Uh, so that means that for the year uh, 5467, that would have to have a leap month inserted. Uh, on the other hand, if we go forward one year, uh, Six eight. Uh, we get eleven, and that's not going to be a leap year. Uh, basically, by using this formula, and it's, it's, it's really brilliant, you can never have two consecutive leap years, and there is never a gap of more than three years between leap years if we use uh, uh, this formula. So that's how the Hebrew calendar works. Now let's go to the calendar we use today, the Gregorian calendar. Uh, and again, don't use modular arithmetic as we use for the Hebrew calendar because, well, Pope Gregory didn't actually think of, well, he didn't develop the calendar. He, he you know, uh, assigned the number of mathematicians and phys physicists and astronomers to work on it. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, they, they just didn't think of doing modular, modular arithmetic. Uh, so suppose instead of repeating every 29 or 32 years, we require the repetition to be a multiple of 100 years. So instead of dividing uh, 0 0.24, et cetera, by seven, we multiply it by 100, uh, as we did in the boring calendar. And we get uh, 24 point, uh, two point something. Uh, so 24 leap years in a 100 year period is insufficient, but 25 is too many. Uh, now, if we just try to use a 100-year cycle, that would be, you know, an unacceptable amount of error. Uh, so here is the continued fraction expansion, uh, and this is going to be uh, of of 24.21, etc. And it's going to be this thing, <laughs> uh, this number right here. First four convergence, uh, 24 plus one fourth. Uh, 24 plus the stuff you see there. And then you have this guy right here. And finally, you know, just get rid of all that stuff. And you have uh, uh, 94 over 97 over 4, 121 over 5, 218 over 9, and 993 over 41. Well, the last convergence should be the most accurate. And so we get, uh, uh, well, just take a look. Uh, 3.65 something times 10 to the minus fourth. But remember our unit of measurement is a period of 100 years. So this would be an error of less than four days every million years. But it has a price. And we would have to add 
993 leap days every 4,100 years. And that would be very tedious. So let's go back to the convergent uh, uh, with 97 over four. And uh, we have to add, uh, its accuracy is off by about three days every 10,000 years. We have to get a rule for this and it's very easy to implement. Uh, if a year is not a multiple of 100, uh, it is a leap year exactly if it's divisible by four. And this accounts for uh, 96 of the required 97 leap days. And now if we just make a year divisible by 400 a leap year, we have our rule. There are 97 leap years in uh, every 400 years. This sound familiar to anybody? Well, that's what we'd use now. That's the Gregorian calendar. Now, the second convergent, uh, which is uh, uh, with 121 over five, that is off by less than two days every uh, 10,000 years. And uh, it's a little better than the first conversion. A slight modification of the previous rule uh, would allow us to assert 121 leap days in a 500 year period. I mean, it's simply the same thing. If it's not a multiple of 100, uh, leap year if it's divisible by four, and otherwise every uh, year divisible by 500 for those divisible uh, are also leap years, that's 121. All right, so much for calendars and so much for, oh, can I get, uh, The size of the screen down now, back to 150. Okay, uh, so now what we're going to do is to look at another application of uh, uh, continued fractions. 1680, Dutch physicist and astronomer Christian Huygens developed an automatic planetarium to show relative motions of the six planets no, uh, around the sun and separately the moon around the earth. And we have the uh, picture below and let me kind of describe it. So you see, it's a little hard to see six things which appear to be circles, uh, basically because we don't see them that well. Uh, and those will have planets uh, around the outside, almost completely invisible, are symbols representing the constellations. Uh, this right here is the movement of the moon around the earth. That's a little extra guy. And over in here, we have spaces which, which will tell you, okay, this is the year you've moved to. And of course, right here, you have a crank and you can move the thing. And these little balls here are gonna just move around and you see exactly where they are and you see when they, they're uh, close to each other, align with each other and, uh, you know, what constellation they're in. Uh, and so that's really kind of nice. I want to look at a close up of the uh, front here and also the back. By the way, I have no idea what this thing is. Anyone know, knows, just shout it out. But uh, you see, if you actually look closely, these are not circles, but near circle ellipses. And of course, Kepler's laws of planetary motion were well known by then. And so uh, the uh, 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 planetarium reflects that. And you see, we have in the middle, we have the sun, there's Mercury right here, there's Venus, they're pretty much well lined up. Uh, Earth is right here, uh, Mars and Jupiter. And of course, as I said, in this close up, uh, the orbit of Saturn is, Saturn is completely uh, out of the picture. On the other hand, the back of the planetarium is on the left-hand side. And let's take a look at that. And uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, this, this, is, this, this is with the cover off, by the way. Uh, uh, but you see a bunch of rods and gears. And with gears comes the problem of how many teeth 
you put into the gear to make the thing do what we want to do. And that's what uh, Christian Huygens, where Christian Huygens used continued fractions. Uh, supposed to be the very first use of continued fractions in uh, an application uh, to some, something outside of just pure mathematics. Okay, where else can we use continued fractions? And I'm going to be very brief with this because, you know, the, we don't want to get into uh, mathematics is too complicated. Well, I didn't want to get into it and, and actually learn it myself, but uh, conjunctions, uh, the, these are, uh, can be special. Uh, essentially, conjunction, uh, conjunction occurs, and it has to be from the viewpoint of a specific observer when two celestial objects at least one of which moves among the stars, have the same right ascension. And they can be special if they have the same declination. For example, if the moon passes in front of Regulus, we have an occultation. If the moon blocks the view of the sun, there is a solar eclipse. An interior planet, Mercury or Venus, passing across the surface of the sun is a transit. And uh, also, for those of you with telescopes who like to look at Jupiter, transits and eclipses of Jupiter's moons are available frequently, and they're readily visible in a telescope. And uh, it's really neat to see those things. Now, predicting such events is complicated by the fact that the position of the observer is a factor. You know, those of you who are thinking ahead to April 2024, where can I see the solar eclipse? Well, you know, you need to be in a position where you have the conjunction uh, visible from that particular place on the Earth. And uh, that's why the eclipse hunters go to specific locations. Now, continue fractions, very powerful tool in predicting conjunctions, but to go beyond this to determine whether or not the conjunction uh, has special properties like the ones above, uh, you know, is uh, uh, there's more sophisticated physics and mathematics involved with, with that. And uh, definitely don't want to go into that today. Okay, so uh, that's the end of the continued fractions part, but I thought I'd, I'd spend the last 10 minutes or so talking about something which some of you may think, think, you, think you know uh, or don't know or, or want to know, uh, and uh, try to get an idea of where uh, 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 of what, what it is. And that is, what the heck is it that a mathematician does? Okay, so uh, first of all, what is it we don't do? Oh my, that sounds like uh, the latest Carly Pierce song. Well, anyway, mathematicians don't use the scientific method. Bet there's a lot of surprise out there. Uh, let's see why. So we're going to attempt to use the scientific method to solve a mathematical problem. Uh, so recall that a prime number is a positive integer p greater than or equal to two, whose only divisors are one and p. So two and three are prime numbers, but four is two times two, so that's not a prime number. Five is a prime number. Uh, six is a uh, two times three, and of course, eight is two times two times two, uh, nine is three times three, 10 is two times five. Uh, so those are not prime numbers. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. We're going to say, P three, you're a bad boy. You're not in this set. So we're gonna consider the set P of all prime numbers excluding three. Each number in P falls into one of two categories. We have L primes, and these are primes which are one less than a multiple of three. And we have M primes, which are one more than a multiple of three. Okay. Now for each N greater than the two, uh, we define a function L for L, for, for L primes, L of N to be the number of L primes less than or equal to N, and M of N to be the number of M primes less than or equal to M. What we want to do is to compare the sizes of these two sets. So let's do the experiment of putting all the primes uh, 
of P, that means it's going to throw out three, into a property ca category. Turns out there are 24. Okay, so fir first prime is two. Two is one less than three, it's an L prime. Next prime is uh, three, we omit that. Five is an L prime, but seven is an M prime. So far, the L primes are ahead. Next prime is 11, that's one less than 12. Uh, 13 is one more than 12. Uh, 17 is one less than 18. 19 is an M prime. Uh, next prime is 23, that's one less than 24, then is 29. But then 31 and 37. Okay, M primes are catching up. They, they haven't been ahead yet. Okay. Uh, then we have 41, 43, 47, uh, 53, 54 minus one. Okay, 59. And 61, 67. Uh, next nut. Number is 71, 71 goes over, 71, yeah, 71 goes over here. And then 73 is an M prime, 79 is one more than 78. Uh, then we have uh, 83, which is one less than 84, 83. Uh, 89 is one less than 90. 91 is not a prime, it's seven times 13, and we have 97. Okay, so this is our scientific experiment. Uh, we've done 24 experiments, and in each of the 24 experiments, the number of <coughs> L primes was bigger than or equal to the number of N primes. Actually, it's always bigger. And the scientific method suggests the following conjecture. Uh, for every integer n greater than or equal to two, L of n is greater than or equal to M of n. Okay. Well, maybe we didn't do enough exper experiments. Uh, well, let's not continue the de demonstration. I'll just give you the results because they're very easy to look up. Uh, so first of all, if we go up to all the primes less than a thousand. It's 167 primes. The conjecture is going to be true. If we go up to all the primes less than a million, that's 78,000 some odd primes. Uh, the conjecture is going to be tr true. Do the experiment more than 50 million times. 50 million times. How many of you have ever done an experiment 50 million times? Uh, that gets you. Are all the values less than 10 to the ninth. But uh, if we get up to 608 billion so and so, uh, not going to read the rest of the digits, that is less than L of that is less than uh, M of that. Oh my goodness, we just did an experiment over. Four billion times, and it worked every time, and it gave us a false result. Whoa. So now you might think that the discovery of the failure of the scientific method is a result of a massive computer search. Uh, however, 1914, uh, a theorem of Littlewood, uh, and actually, this is more gen general than this particular. Uh, pair of sequences is actually, uh, you know, uh, certain sequences satisfying certain properties. This is one of many pairs of sequences that satisfy those properties. Uh, he predicted that M of N will eventually pass L of N and that they flip back and forth infinitely many times. Okay. Uh, there are no computers capable of doing this cap cap calculation back then. Uh, here's something going on up over there. So anyway, the scientific method can't be used to prove absolute certainty. Well, what do mathematicians use? 
Uh, okay, so those of you who, who have actually had 10th grade and took your geometry course in the 10th grade, uh, you remember all those uh, theorems from Euclid and their proofs? Uh, well, that's not just math, that's uh, uh, geometry, that's just all of mathematics. The only acceptable evidence for truth of a, of a mathematical statement is a proof. Okay, and I want to do uh, a very simple one just to give you an idea of what uh, one has to do. Uh, so we're going to be using odd integers. The first thing we have to do is a precise definition of odd integers. And this is one that mathematicians generally uh, accept. An integer n is odd, provided that n equals 2k plus 1 for some integer k. Okay, and we prove the following statement about odd integers. Start with an n being an odd integer, then n squared has to be an odd integer. By the way, this proof is simple. I mean, it's like an exercise second week in my, you know, my former math for liberal arts classes. So let's take, take a look, look at the uh, proof. First of all, if then statements, uh, when you have to prove one of them, all the stuff after if, but not getting up to the comma before then, that's called the hypothesis. That's stuff that is. Uh, asserted to be true. Everything after the word then is what you have to prove. So our proof can look like this. Uh, we have that n equals 2k plus 1 for some integer. Remember, that's whole number. And when you try to prove something, always good to take a look at what you're trying to prove and see if you're right in a simpler way. I'm gonna write something uh, wrong deliberately here, just so that I can talk about it. Okay, and you see what the rest is. But this is wrong. And the reason is we've already committed the letter K to being the number you have to multiply by two and add one to for to, to show that N is an odd integer. You can't reuse that letter again. But we got plenty of alphabet left. So we'll just make it, whoops, I went too far. Uh, So we must prove that n is equal to uh, 2r plus 1 for some integer r. OK, so let's actually work with n squared and see what we have. Well, n squared, we don't know that it's 2r uh, plus 1, but we do know that n squared can be written as 2k plus 1. Whoops. Quantity squared. Okay, because we know that n is 2k plus 1, so n squared is just 2k plus 1 squared. Okay, and now either use your foil or whatever, and you get four. Maybe you've memorized the rule for uh, the square of a binomial. If you have that squared. We have n squared is four uh, k squared plus four k plus one. Now let's look at what we want to prove. We want to prove that n is two r plus one for some integer r. We don't have a specific value for r. We just want to be able to construct the right value for r. Well, let's see. What we have to have to show. We have to show two r plus one. Look at the plus one here. That plus one matches with that plus one. So that part is good. The thing we have to do is to make 4k squared plus 4k look like two times something, okay? And so this is not something you would ever do in you know, simplifying an algebraic expression or solving uh, an algebraic equation. 
but it is exactly what you have to do here. Okay. Then we let R equal uh, the expression 2K squared plus 2K. Oops. And we're done. And we're done in two ways. I want to thank everyone for your attention. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, Bob. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, oh, by the way, I'll be uh, uh, saving the document and I'll actually be posting a PDF of the uh, uh, the, the PDF of the uh, uh, presentation uh, onto the mailing list. Okay, I'm just looking through the uh, chat. Okay. Great presentation, Bob. I enjoyed that. Oh, thank you so much, Bob. Oh, oh okay. I see Sam put uh, five seven eight three is a current year, but uh, you just go ahead and do the, do that and see whether or not you have a leap month this year. And in fact, you can look ahead to all your future years and see when leap months are gonna occur now that you have the formula. Okay. So I'll stop sharing. How many sharing years back does the continued fraction go? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Oh, how many years back did people know about the continued fraction? Uh, the first time it was continued fraction you know, from as as we know it now was sort of uh, uh, late sixteenth century, but there's some you know parallels to it going back to Euclid. So, uh, and uh, and and you know it may be that some people have uh, ha had used it but just never actually. Uh, looked at it from that point of view. I see. Yeah, but uh, Hodgins really definitely- don't know. It may have been even before the 16th century. Uh, yeah, well, well, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a thing in, in Euclidean, uh, in, 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 in mathematics called the Euclidean algorithm, which despite the fact that it says Euclid is not geometry, it's, it's Pure, pure number theory. It's you know an algorithm for finding the greatest common divisor of two numbers, and the continued fraction is basically doing the same work, but not writing it the same way. 
So in some sense, you can say, yeah, you could throw it up, you just didn't write it that way. Oh, okay. Okay, anything else? Hey, Bob, you mentioned about the uh, number of teeth on the gears for those devices. So I guess this is this extended out. You go out so many continuous fractions and then you come up with as close to the number of teeth that you think would work? Yeah, you, you, you uh, or actually, actually, I think you, you probably go out as many steps as you need to get the accuracy you like, uh, rather than just say, you know, go out five steps and hope it works. Uh, you know, in, in, in other words, you saw how I was computing, you know, for the first few examples, I was computing the error that of the computer, uh, the continued fraction versus the actual number. And, uh, uh, you know, so so uh, if you if you know at least the decimal, ex a, a very accurate decimal expansion of the accurate uh, of the actual number, uh, you can actually just subtract the two, take absolute values, and you say, okay, I'm within uh, 10 to the minus 30, third power, that's good enough for my needs, or maybe you want to be within 10 to the uh, minus sixth power. Okay, thank you. Hey, Bob, I got a question. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the dates on this, but have you thought about checking to see if uh, Derek DeSolo Pool or any of the people who've researched uh, the done the recent research on the Antikythera mechanism, if perhaps the gearing and continued fractions might be used to explain the capabilities of that device? Uh, you know, I, I, I thought about looking for that and maybe trying to include it in the talk, but uh, I really couldn't find anything conclusive. Uh, but, you know, that, that device definitely looks, has the flavor of, you know, being constructed by people who knew contingent fractions. So, yeah. but, you know, I, 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 uh, and Sam, you pro you're, you're up in this better than I am, but I kind of suspect that very little is known about that civilization and uh, how good their knowledge level is. And, you know, I don't know, I'm not an expert on the knowledge of any civilization, but uh, what I, I do know is that there have been recent X-ray studies and various other kinds of uh, imaging done in slices through it so that even if the entire thing is all uh, calcified or replaced by minerals, there are some ideas as to what exists inside it. It would really be, and that stuff has even appeared in popular uh, literature, even, you know, the big articles in the Sunday Times <laughs> a year or two ago. It might be interesting uh, entertainment for you who understand continuing fractions far better than I ever will, but if you found suddenly that uh, there was evidence of that. Yeah, uh, again, I- <clears throat> Just giving you more work to do, that's all. It's just, yeah, just more work. I mean, I, I, I thought about the fact that, you know, this looks like something that if they didn't use it, it would have been helpful if they did. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, that's Alfonso the Wise brought back to modern times. He was a king of Spain, something in the 1400s. He said, had I been present at the time of creation, I could have given the Lord a few useful suggestions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So do we have anything else? Uh, I think I've looked at all the chat. Yeah, so let me just check to see. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't looking at the chat at the time that, uh, yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Sam, Sam, Sam posted five seven eight three. Uh, as you know, so so as to whether or not it's uh, a a leap uh, a leap year, you know, will they have to add a leap month? You know, you again just do the arithmetic of. Uh, 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 and I, I don't know if they used continuing fractions, uh, but relative to the calculation of the calendar, I do know this. Uh, there is also the necessity of not having uh, the, the holiday of Yom Kippur occurring on a Sunday, if I'm correct. I think, Joel, is that correct? It can't happen on a Sunday. Right, because you can't right. cook on, on right. Saturday. Okay, so the result of that is that there are actually six different lengths of years. You have regular or non-leap years, a regular year with one day added or a regular year with two days added. Then there are leap years with the intercalary month and a leap year with one day added and a leap year with two days added. I've also seen two books, which I no longer have, they, if they still exist, they're on Long Island somewhere, which explain specifically how the calendar is calculated from an arithmetic uh, standpoint, uh, what they apparently did by brute force in ancient Babylonia is that they came up with a unit of time measurement, which in English is called a moment. In Hebrew, I think it's called a chalok. But the number of them is so many thousands and thousands in what we would call one second of time, that if you follow the just normal arithmetic with those, you can get it accurately because that is a calendar based on both the sun and the moon, and it's gone on for 5,700 or more years. Uh, it's the longest standing calendar on earth and it's never needed correction. Uh, but it was, I don't know that they did it by continuing fractions. I had the impression for all my life that they simply created gears mentally that had such tiny teeth. It, it's inconceivable to me, but they found numbers that worked. And one, I, I know the author's name of those, of each of the two books. I have no idea where to find them now. And I, in a way, I don't want to know, but uh, it was wildly complicated then. Yeah. Well, it's, as I said, this is an, an interesting uh, thing to study. And, uh, you know, the mathematics of it is, I mean, I mean, I, 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 I'm sort of in awe of, okay, you go, you, you, you go out four times and you're accurate to within, you know, 10 to the minus six power. Uh, and, and even, even the thing with, with pi, you know, three, what, what was it? 355 or 113. I think that's what, what I had. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's accurate to six decimal places and your denominator is only 113. Yeah. I mean, the key is the key is, and and this is especially important for uh, gear ratios. You know, get the optimal gear ratio. I mean, you know, if uh, if if thirteen is good, then fourteen is going to be terrible. Uh, so, uh, and then maybe you know, thirty three will be good. You know, but but uh, you know, that's that's. Uh, that's re that's really amazing is how the continued fraction gives you that particular level of accuracy. Right. Well, 355 over 113 is more accurate than 22 divided by 7, but it's also a case of where you're balancing accuracy against convenience for the intended user. Yeah. Yeah. They may say that's good enough for government work or something like that. Yeah, but uh, if we well, if we do, yeah. So so basically, you're saying, you know, doing decimal places, uh, decimal points is really what you have to go. 
but uh, you know, no. So I can I can see what you mean. No, but I mean, if you said to uh, your average undergraduate or uh, high school student or whatever, uh, here go learn three fifty five over one thirteen. And if they forget the value, but they remember the fraction, it would take them 20 minutes to do the division until, until they get the answer. But, yeah. Uh, but, you know, they, 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 have, they have their, their, their handheld calculators. Yeah. Where, where they could do it in a second. I mean, you, you notice that uh, in my presentation, I, I, I deliberately left some of the mathematics out and I just had the computer algebra system do the calculations for me, just, you know, I mean, I was almost surprised, like, you know, when I did the first one on the prime factorization, and all of a sudden this number appeared and nobody said, oh my, what happened there? Yeah. I, I, as you were doing it, uh, and was going back and forth between the rows, I had the impression, I don't remember what number it was, but I had the impression that there was one missing, and I was trying in my head to figure out you know what the factors were what really was a prime or wasn't a prime uh i have to wrap my oh, head the, around oh, the uh, the uh, the prime factorization yeah the l and the m's the l and the m's yeah now, i'm pretty sure i got all of them well you did if you said there were 24 because there actually were 24 yeah but uh, not uh -huh. 25 but uh, uh, but, but, but the, the the only the only number that should give anybody any trouble is 91. Okay. And 91 is seven times 13. Because first of all, you can, you know, if a number uh, n is, except for two and five, if a number ends in anything other one, th three, seven or nine, it can't be a prime. You know, because the, 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 you know, the, the numbers that end in zero, two, four, six, Eight are all uh, uh, divided by two, and you know five and zero are divided by five. So, uh, and then if you add the sum of the digits of, of a number, and it is a uh, multiple of three, then it's divisible by three. Okay, and that has to do with the fact that uh, you know uh, nine is one less which is three squared is one less than the base. Right. Well, when I see the, the PDF of that, I'm sure that that's the one thing I'm going to look to see. What was that number that I thought should have been the next one? And yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah but, but but actually, actually, once once you clear all that out, uh, all that's left among the composites that you have in court with those rules are 49, which is seven squared, and 91, which is seven. Uh, oh, 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 one, one third, third rule. If the first and last digits are the same, it's divisible by 11. And uh, 91 is seven times 13. That's, you know, those are the only ones that are hard going up to 100. And then after that, it gets considerably harder. But uh, yeah, when you see the PDF, you can check and see. Uh, yeah, you know, and again, I did I did it on the fly, you know, so. Uh, Easy for you, difficult for me. Oh, Bob, do you, yeah. do, do, does it, do you think that the continued fractions came into use or came into existence or being as a result of a need to solve something like, let's say like develop a calendar or was it just something I don't know if, there's, if anyone's got any history on I, I I would I would think that well, first of all, they came into existence as pure mathematics. And lots of times pure mathematics, you know, just, you know, it, we, we, mathematicians do mathematics just for mathematics sake, not, not to worry about, is this going to be applied to anything? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Hardy, you know, a famous uh, 19th century, uh, uh, 20th century uh, mathematician, bragged about the fact that number theory had no useful applications whatsoever, except that without number theory, you cannot have computer security. So the, uh, I, I, 
the 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 place where you can apply uh, uh, certain bits of mathematics is just kind of sitting out there waiting. You just, you just do the mathematics, and you know maybe the stuff that you create is going to be useful sometime, and maybe it isn't. So, uh, 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 you know, uh, that's pretty much, uh, you know, how, uh, and so I, I think, I, I think that continued fractions just kind of arose as a bit, you know, well, first of all, they're really tied in with the Euclidean algorithm, the, the method of finding the GCD. I mean, it's just, just taking that method and writing it in a little different way. It's, as I said, Euclidean algorithm, that was, that was, uh, uh, that was in Euclid's book. I don't know if he, I mean, you know, I don't know if he discovered any of the mathematics in his book, but that's, that, that was in the elements. Uh, but, uh, you know, so uh, uh, I would think that the very first thing that you think of in terms of can I use a, a equivalence fractions is gear ratios. Because, you know, the, the number you want is probably an irrational number. And so you can't actually get an exact gear ratio for it, but get the gear ratio that is within the uh, tolerance that you, you're, you're willing to, uh, to have, an, have uh, an error. You're always gonna have some slop with gears anyway, because it's required in order for them to work. Even a worm in sector will give you the ratios, but you do have to have a certain amount of slop in there also, as anybody who's guided a telescope uh, that's got a mechanical drive knows that. You know, it, it, it'll go back and forth around that position in the right ascension gear. Uh -huh. Hey, Ken, don't forget to uh, stop the recording at some point. Oh, sure. Okay. Thank you. It will fill up our, hang on one sec.